Hey, Joanna, how are you? Hey, Tim. Yeah, I'm good. How are you doing? Yeah, not bad. Thanks. Um, okay, well, thanks for coming on today. Um, a lot of a lot's happened in recent months with some of the sort of activism and the things that you've been campaigning for. But um, well, we'll just start with what's you know what's been going on recently with Disrupt the Hub, or what what's Disrupt the Hub about? Like, what are you involved in at the moment? Yeah, first of all, I'm just going to correct you and say it's Disrupt Bar Up Hub. Okay. Um, that's the name of our campaign. But um, yeah, so the campaign has been pretty active, I guess, since the beginning of the year. And we've undertaken uh, a number of different actions, um, all to bring attention to Woodside's activities on the Bar Up, specifically around the the threat they pose to um, First Nations sacred rock art sites up there and also broadly to the climate. Um, so, you know, Bar Up Hub taking in Scarborough Gas, which I think a lot of people are familiar with, uh, and a range of other projects which together form to combine, like a, a super project, um, which is, if it, you know, it's projected, if, it's, if it goes fully online, it's projected to um, six billion tonnes of CO2 over its lifetime, which is um, makes it the biggest, the most polluting project in Australia, bigger than, like four times bigger than Adani. So um, really want to bring attention to that because I don't feel like anyone's really talking about it. Um, and so my role in, in that campaign, I guess my the most visible role I've had is in the action I undertook at the Art Gallery in January. Um, I spray painted the Woodside logo onto uh, an artwork. Uh, and yeah, it's been a wild ride since then, um, to say the least. Yeah, how, like it is, and you pointed out Woodside, are there any other players in this that you've, you're trying to like shine a light on that are doing the, the bad things? Yeah, um, there's many, I think um, probably, I couldn't name all of them, but there are definitely a, a, a number of different large fossil fuel slash uh, mineral slash other large industry players who uh, either have uh, facilities up there or are looking to build facilities or expand existing facilities up there um, that are all contributing emissions and um, just... Uh, they're a blight on on that beautiful um, country. So, yeah, absolutely. And so, when you were like you were trying to raise awareness, um, obviously the the paintings iconic. Um, people sort of like I just I'm not uh, I haven't really been following that era of art, but like I know the image. You know, it's pretty. Mm -hmm. So, what was the thinking behind that? And uh, was it just to raise awareness about Woodside or was it like, um, and did you expect to get, were there anything like in regards to support or, or people that weren't comfortable with what you did um, in that whole process? What, what, what was the sort of the thinking behind it and what was the sort of outcome? Mm, yeah, big question. The thinking uh, behind it, I guess, um, the, yeah, like you're right, the artwork itself, I think, is probably one of the most iconic pieces, both from that era of um, like early colonial Australian painting, but also one of the jewels, I guess, in WA's crown of art. Um, I remember learning about it in high school. So I think like a lot of people have m memories of that, of learning about that piece and maybe yet, like you have the image of it in their head. Um, so the thinking behind targeting that piece was, um, there are a number of different factors. I think one of the key ones is that it, what it represents and the, what the artist Frederick McCubbin stood for when he was alive. He was an early environmentalist um, and what he depicted in that painting really speaks to, um, you know, like the sacred and uh, important uh, role and place that 
the environment has in our lives. Um, and it also, at the time, I don't know where the piece is now or, or what is exhibited in that gallery space, but at the time of the action, the, the exhibition, well, that piece was in an exhibition that was explicitly around interrogating uh, Australia's colonial history and, um, you know, uh, it, was, it was asking uncomfortable questions of us um, around, you know, can't think of the word. Um, it, it, it was, uh, oh, sorry, I've like totally lost what I was saying. Um, That's cool. So but, like, yeah, it was like, his, it was like a relevant, like the issues, I guess, relevant to that colonial history are playing out now in a really big way, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think one of the other key factors around it which is, is probably a little less symbolic and more so a logistical um, perspective on it was that we, I knew that the piece was protected by Perspex. I uh, had no intention as an artist myself and also as a person who's, um, you know, I'm concerned with um, creating good things in the world as opposed to destroying them. And so it was never my intention to actively damage a piece of art. And so knowing that it was protected by Perspex meant that it was, um, that was, that was one of the reasons I targeted it because it was not going to be damaged. And I guess it is also like, like what we were saying at the beginning is that it's so iconic and targeting an iconic piece is obviously going to have, that's going to reverberate more broadly throughout uh, the public when they, when they see the action and um i've forgotten the rest of the parts of your question i'm oh, sorry. sorry no no oh, actually that leads me to something that's important i i thought it was a bit disingenuous well i saw some of the reporting and coming from different places like the guardian and news.com um for example news.com like back in january they said priceless artwork defaced in protest and yet you as you said the perspex protected that piece of artwork um, yeah yeah and that so was, that was very um that was kind of how it was reported across the board just like either they neglected to mention at all that it was protected that it was never intended to be damaged excuse me or it was buried like right at the bottom oh by the way this wasn't damaged and so you know we know how people consume media they don't often read the entire article they read the headlines or they read the little you know, intro bit at the start. And so the way they framed it was, was disingenuous, I think. Yeah. The clickbait, um, <laughs> era that we're yeah. in, but, um, but yeah, so, and the reaction that you got from across, you know, there would have been, you know, a lot of, you know, you, from the arts community, did you find, were you surprised at the support or the people that opposed, was there anything that, you know, came, that came out of that, that you found to be something that you didn't expect? Yeah, I actually didn't know how it would be received at all. I made the decision to do it um, without really consulting with anybody in the arts community. And I think anyone who works in the arts community knows that arts administrators, at least, are very conservative or arts institutions can be very conservative. Um, and so I kind of thought that I would be shunned from the arts community and that I was basically just killing any like tiny art career that I have established at this point. Um, yeah, that I would be shunned and blacklisted and um, people would kind of just go, how could you do this? But overwhelmingly, the response I got from the art community was just amazing amazingly supportive and even one of the bits of feedback that i got that i really kind of treasure is um someone who has a history of working in the art gallery of wa i think on like contracts or something um reached out to me and said that this was the most interesting thing that had happened in the art gallery for years um, which again goes to the conservative nature of arts institutions. Um, but yeah, I think 
the arts community has not only um, supported it, but they've kind of taken it almost further in that they've interpreted it as almost like an art piece in and of itself, or like performance art. And then the resulting um, piece of perspex with the spray paint on it is is an art piece now, um, which, yeah, it's kind of, it's got many layers, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Like the, I just, the yellow logo and the stencil and everything. And um, because it takes a lot of guts to do something like that. And I can't imagine the thoughts that goes, you know, go through head. Okay, we're here, we're going to do it, you know. And there's a lot of, um, I guess, power in understanding that it's just a like an everyday person taking action to highlight this and you said you work in the you're like you're an artist and so that must have been weighing your mind quite a bit and so what sort of and how long have you been in like the arts community for so it just gives us a bit of perspective like into how it led to this yeah uh, I feel like I'm, I'm very new to the art world like I did not study art at uni or anything so I, I don't come from like an arts background although I have been sort of practicing art for my whole life um, I think probably on like a professional level I've been in the arts community for like a couple of years really mm -hmm. yeah and do you find that um, that when you when you did that did you have people reach out to you for support after that and were or what do you did you think do you have an idea that it would unfold that the way that it did or did um would you say that the the intention of what you you tried to highlight there do you think you achieved the goal of what you did i guess i'm trying to ask yeah yeah i i think so i honestly like obviously taking this kind of an action is um often the the message behind the action gets lost in the action itself and people latch on to like the sensational um, action more so than why the person did it. Um, but I think prior to, and like, again, it's hard to say because I'm, I'm in my own bubble where I talk to people who have similar views to me and who are exposed to similar media to me um, but my read on it is that um, prior to this action and the subsequent actions that disrupt bar pub have taken the the threat to the rock art and the like unfathomable scale of the of the project that woodside is seeking to to develop up there was not really on the national agenda i don't think that even in Perth, even in WA, I don't think people were necessarily familiar with with either of those aspects of maybe even sometimes I've had some some feedback I've had is like people saying they didn't even know the rock art existed. And now now they not only know it exists, but they know it's under threat and that it is actually being like it's currently there's evidence of it being destroyed as we speak without the project having expanded yet. Um, and then there's also that element of like, everybody knows about Adani, everybody knows about the massive threat that poses. Uh, and I think my actions and, and the actions of the campaign as a whole have brought that to the national, like, you know, people know about it now more, more so around the country than they did before. Yeah. And, you know, like I find that it's really ironic that, you know, there's perspex covering this iconic painting and security guards and police and courts and, you know, and all these things that come with, you know, those types of actions when you're trying to highlight what's going on to what is some of the oldest artwork ever, like in the world. Like it mm. just, and, you know, these industries damage these things and there's no no security guards coming into or police arresting those folks that are doing the worst. So yeah. Yeah. Which I find really, yeah. The irony is, you know, how it just hasn't really clicked with some people and I, I have yeah. seen, and it's probably not worth reading some of the comments, but, um, yeah. but I mean, you know, 
what like it has brought that thing up and so the group that you're involved in um and i'm sorry with, with the name disrupt Bar- 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 <laughs> That's okay. uh, it's, it's just, you know it's just you know um i um how does how did how long has that been around for um so i think like the the genesis of it has like it's been kicking around as an idea among some of our campaign team for i think a couple of years they've been like you know, trying to figure out the best way to tackle this project. Um, But it really got off the ground, I think, towards the end of last year, the beginning of this year. Um, So it's fairly new. Um, But the the folks that I'm working with are very experienced and seasoned campaigners. Um, So they've been working on a range of different climate and other social issues for a really long time. Yeah, and what's and and following the action, how is you know like you know climate change isn't going away. The actions on the peninsula by these companies are just they're they're planning to carry on with what they're doing. Are you looking to do to um? Do you, have you found that the extra the support that you've got through this action is going to help going forward? I yeah, definitely. I think we have the visibility and we have very um like we have a community behind us now whereas before i think we you know when we when we undertook my action which was the first action kind of under the umbrella of disrupt bar pub we didn't have a profile at all whereas now i think we we have the backing of the community and um we have that both in a in a material sense like people really willing to to offer up financial support for us, um, but then also in a um, like in a broad sort of social sense, we have that support, and I think it's it's really exciting to to think about how we leverage that and kind of um, yeah lean into it really, and um, I don't want to say escalate things because yeah. I don't want to foreshadow anything, but you know, our name mm. is disrupt pub. That's the whole intention. So. Yeah. And do you, do you find, um, like obviously being a person who hasn't, you know, this is quite significant action. Um, how did you, did you have any one you looked to or were you, you know, it, it takes a bit, have you like, was there an inspiration or, things that you've seen happening around the world that was, you know, something that you took from other persons or other groups actions that you, so that you fed this into your, you know, sort of your motivation to do what you did? Um, I don't think that I can identify any specific movement or action or person who inspired me, but I think um, it's like the people that I work with are, they're, I, I find them very, like the, the energy in the room about um, how important it is to tackle this issue and how, you know, Woodside's activities are such a massive threat to us um, and how every, like everyone brings this boldness to our discussions that is really infectious and I really, um, I guess, Broadly, I mean, having worked in like progressive politics now for about five years, I've been exposed to all of these really amazing, inspirational people, um, many of whom have these like long, impressive histories of direct action and activism. So like, you know, Bob Brown, for instance, and people like Joe Valentine, People who just, they know what they need to do. They know that it comes at a a pretty significant personal cost, but that sort of pales in comparison to the call to do something. Um, And so I think, uh, yeah, I kind of just channeled all of that into this because, yeah, it is, it was a pretty big decision, I think, to take this action. Um, And I, yeah, I I kind of, 
I never thought I would be someone who would take this action until I did it. And then it was like, now I'm, now I'm a person who, who does things like this. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's like you cross the threshold mm. and then suddenly things don't seem so radical anymore or something. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, the absurdity of having to, you know, like in the past, when you go to the conservative side of politics or the labor or, or whoever, like what's the, the people in power, um, mm. you know, they just dismiss things and they say, well, you just write a letter to the MP or you just, you know, put together a petition or you, yeah, or you just, you know, you write a story and you put it out there and you, like your concern is the way that things go. But I think, you know, especially following the 2019 fires, when you see the destruction and, you know, you've got people, you know, pretty much chastising, you know, an activist group over like a stencil and some paint, you know, it's like a big yeah. outrage yet you yeah. look at the landscape burning in New South Wales and Victoria and you go, you know, what's, you know, this, you can't, there's no comparison. Um, right. and I think, I think that's, I think that's why more people are taking action, more everyday people. Mm. Yeah. yeah, definitely. It's yeah. like there's the, the further we get, like the, the more time progresses, the more that we see that there isn't any action being taken by the government that like, there's nothing else on the table at this point. Like you said, we're not, let us for years we've we've run petitions we've rallied on the streets there is nothing else left except at, that i can think of at this point except for like disruptive direct action and i think it's um yeah some of the criticism that i've received and that the campaign has received is that you know like you can be disruptive but you should still obey the law and it's like well that's not disruptive then really is it like and i think um Greta Thunberg said something similar recently around, um, you know, this like it's time to break the law now. Like, this the law's not working. We need to we need to push it, and that's what needs to be done. Like, no more playing nice, really. Yeah, and I I think um, when I'm just looking at some of the comments being made from different groups and depending where you are in the world depends on, you know, how governments have been reacting to this, you know, they're passing more draconian laws. Yeah. You know, you, we've seen, you know, climate protesters get, you know, like crazy penalties. Um, and I just, you know, last year or the year before seeing, you know, climate activists in one state in America getting seven years in prison for, or I think it was around seven years for disrupting a pipeline another state yeah. you know having getting being put on probation and it's it's almost as if you know well it's almost as if the oil and gas companies pretty much you know oh, write the policy um, yeah yeah and um yeah so and how do you find like um jumping into this space do you find like ha have you met a lot more um, like younger people getting involved in these, in these, um, spaces that you never thought would, is that something that you've seen happen in recent times, especially post COVID as people mm -hmm. are drawing their mind back towards climate change and other issues, because we all know just before COVID hit, like the world was protesting and, um, yeah. and I think something's happening now, which is sort of building us back to that point. Yeah. Yeah. Totally agree. Um, I was, yeah, even having chats with people about this today, about the the momentum that we had behind the moment in 2019 and how it just totally dropped off and how we're kind of almost having to start again. Um, yeah, I'm definitely seeing a lot of young people um, kind of getting more involved. And it's not, it's not a surprise though, and it's not anything that I have not expected. In fact, I think what I'm more surprised about is that there aren't more young people being involved. Um, I think that the, I mean, I, I don't know if I'm actually the right person to ask about that because mm. I'm you know, not, not a spring chicken. So <laughs> I, I don't have that much involvement with, with young people. Um, but yeah. I, certainly I, I probably like, should have reframed it. I'm thinking more people that, you know, you know, I, you know, I, I remember meeting with a former security guard at a climate protest uh, and she was in her 50s and she'd never, she goes, if you asked me 10 years or last year, if, whether I'd be on this sort of front line, you know, protesting, 
um, I would say you're mad, but then, you know, when I see the destruction and the inaction, um, I almost feel like, you know, especially we've had a change of government in Australia, I almost feel like mm. the frustration is more like you expect it in a way. And there's a slight little bit of hope that the new government that knocks out, well, we've seen a, the change of a conservative government in Australia who was obviously bad with climate. And mm. there's that little bit of hope that the new one, the better alternative will come in and save us and they haven't. So mm. that's something that I find really interesting, that dynamic um, where these, where like the people that traditionally looked to say the Labor Party, for example, in Australia is the savior of us for any reason um, that would put their neck on the line with policy and take on industry are just not doing that. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of expecting more. Like I, I think there's going to be more like coming out of what's going on. Yeah, yeah, and I think like I hate to I hate to suggest that it may happen or that we may need to wait until the next election because I don't think that electoral politics is where it's all at obviously. Um but yeah, I think you know the previous government like you said was so obviously shit on this issue and it was very easy to like mobilize people on the streets against the Morrison government and broadly the coalition. But um, I think with the election of the Labor government, people are kind of like, yeah, expecting, I think people obviously expected more, but maybe people are almost, because we're getting like a little bit of progress, I think maybe people are seeing that as like, okay, that'll do. Like maybe I don't need to mobilize on the streets and go to these rallies as much because we have a safeguard mechanism, whatever that means. And maybe if they, you know, over the coming, you know, the Labor government has been in power for a year now, over the coming couple of years before the next federal election, people may see that actually this tinkering around the edges that the Labor government is doing is not good enough. And maybe that could be a really good thing for left-wing politics in this country. I'm hoping. I mean, the the actual hope is that the Labor government actually is good and does what we want them to, but um, we know that's not going to happen. So. Yeah, I think the sort of the fine line between you know the industries that supported the conservative side of politics are definitely doing the same thing to the centre. I'm calling it centre because it's like we're almost living in an era where the traditional left major party is moved into a space, which pretty much reflects this moderate conservative. Absolutely. You know, yeah. And the same industry folks support them. Um, do you, do you have any like at or well, advice if there are people out there who think, Oh geez, you know, I'm really concerned about this, but you know, I don't know whether to, I don't know where to start. Do you have any advice to people that who might want to get involved? Um, around the Disrupt Borough Pub group or uh, in the climate movement more generally? Yeah, I think like, I I understand what it's like to feel a bit overwhelmed by where to be, like I've been there before, not knowing where to begin, not knowing who to connect with or where my efforts are best directed. Um, I think the first thing I would say is that sadly, even though attending rallies is really important and like we should all attend rallies, that's not enough. I think we need to, I, I totally recognize that direct action is not available as a tool to everybody. I recognize and acknowledge my privilege in being able to break the law as a white person in a fairly democratic country. Um, my life isn't at risk by doing that. That's not everybody's situation. But if you are in a similar position to me, I think it's um, the way that I see it is it's my duty to step up and do this. So I would encourage everybody fucking break the law, like do it. I think that's what we need. Um, but if that's not available to you, I think just get involved wherever you can, like find our, our campaign is focused on, well, like I said, climate change broadly, but also specifically on this project. 
in Western Australia. Um, so there are different campaigns focusing on different things like political donations or, um, you know, changing the system or breaking down capitalism or whatever, or even the Greens, like joining the Greens and involved there because electoral politics does have an important role to play. Um, just do what you can and do more than going to rallies and sharing posts on social media. As important as those things are, they're not enough and we need more like actual people engaging in actual action. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, like you, I think you pretty much summed up a lot of what's, you know, you know, a lot of those doubts, you know, even for me years ago, like having to think about, you know, even to go to the rally and, you know, what's the next step if things don't change, um, mm -hmm. which is a real like, sense of especially when you start thinking about like your kids so I've got nephews and what sort of world they're going to grow up into and yeah and just the fact that 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 art like the rock art should be there for them um and totally. how a temporary company could just try to extract what they want do what they want and then just leave and they're not going to be mm -hmm. around in 100 years time you know like yeah yeah um and and just you know and I encourage people um who who might not know about the project and what's going on to just to look at the whole thing, because how does, I don't even know how in this day and age you can rationalize a project and go out for decades, you know, mm -hmm. to the gas industry. So, um, obviously like so many things and someone said to me this morning that, you know, how do you, how do we keep refilling ourselves to keep going, um, had it for the long haul, because we just can't burn out. Um, is there anything that you try and, do yourself to try and make sure that you're there to keep going and fight like how you I know, I know art's a thing that you do but is that a part of your way of processing everything um it should be more than it is right now I, it's yeah I don't really have that much time for it and I'm pretty rubbish at self-care but I think one of the things that really again not to constantly be quoting Greta Thunberg but I think she said something once about um, uh, what was it? something about like hope comes from action and that is what fills me up and keeps me um, like keeps me coming back and keeps me fired up is participating directly in these actions. And I don't just mean like an arrestable action. It's like going to organizing meetings and um, you know, being a part of things on the ground as opposed to, because I was the same, like, in the beginning of my, like, you know, political awakening, I would go to rallies and then nothing would happen and I'd feel a bit demoralised and then when the next rally would come up, I'd be like, I should probably go, but, like, last time it was fine and nothing really happened and I don't really know what to do next. But being active and seeing, like, seeing your actions have a repercussion and influence other people as well that is what um like keeps my energy up and keeps me motivated um yeah i really really think like it's hard to it's hard to keep hope alive in in this time that we live in but i really think that action yields hope yeah i and you know i was actually looking at and that is, that quote is correct exactly um and it was a quote from 2018 when it's october 2018 it's just in front of me um and greta said when we start to act hope is everywhere so instead of looking for hope look for action then the yes. hope will come and i yes, think exactly you know i remember that resonating and encapsulated with that quote that you said before i think that's something that um you know that it's you can't sit idle i think that's the mm -hmm. that's the message and yeah i really you know and yeah truly inspirational to um for that to come out of that time but for that to mean that you know in the art gallery of western australia you acted and i think that's quite powerful so yeah um so we'll, we'll like we're close to wrapping up but i hope to think that we'd like to see more of disrupt borough pub um and the actions taken 
Uh, is there anything, you know, it's hard, like obviously we've talked about the artwork. Is there anywhere um, you would point people to to actually see um, this? Is there a website that you can think of or um, database that um, you can point to that you can, any anyone listening to this would be able to just look online and can find it that can actually see what you're trying to protect? Um, yeah, I mean, I would say... And I say this as a person who admittedly has not been to visit the rock art at the far up. I have not had an opportunity yet, but I would, I'm very, very keen to get up there. I'm going to as soon as I can, but I would say almost try to get up there um, and see it for yourself. Um, but beyond that, I think, I, I mean, I don't have a specific uh, resource in mind, but there is some really amazing content um, online and on Instagram. Um, in particular, there's um, there's a couple of tour companies, First Nations led tour companies um, based up there. Who um, there was a like a a reel or something that they posted quite recently that showed how, just how close the industry is to the rock art. Like it's not it's not like tucked away it's it's like right next to it you see the rock art and you see the gas flares right next to it um so i think that is a really powerful realization is to have those two um and like right next to each other and seeing um how just heartbreaking that is um and uh, yeah, I, that's, that's probably something that I should have a better answer for, but that, no, no, that's like, my... I think, I, well, I'll, I'll put some of the videos in the comments, um, the, the, what you mentioned with the reels. And I also know like with Save Us Online's and yeah. a number of other groups yeah. like have taken some amazing footage, but yeah, I think that's, it's good to show, you know, and I think, I guess it's also the beauty of what's going on today is the way that we are connected, you know, this interview, the way that we can do this, we can, you know, be able to put, you know, pretty much anything in someone's on someone's phone so they can see it. And so, yeah, mm -hmm. I'll make sure that those links are in the um, comments and everything, but I just like to, yeah, thank you for today, but I'm sure this won't be the last time we talk and um, we will make sure to reconnect probably later on in the year once you know there's a few other yeah. things that will unfold in time but yeah i'd just like to thank you so much for being you know open and you know willing to talk today i know that you know it's not easy what you've done um but um you know i'm looking forward to you mentioned um um before today on may 2nd there's a there's a forum coming up so i'll make sure to put that in the comments as well what yeah. and just quickly what's that forum about so people know yeah, so it's a forum um, that will be um, held on the 2nd of May, like you said, um, in Fremantle in WA. Um, it is on the topic of protest and protecting our right to protest. So we're going to be discussing, um, yeah, like the police overreach in WA and in Australia more broadly, um, the, the way that the police and the authorities are targeting climate activists in particular. Um, and so, yeah, the panel is going to be really, really great. There's, I will be joined by Violet Coco, who's coming from New South Wales. We'll also have Sophie McNeil from Human Rights Watch and uh, Josie Alec from Save Us Onlines. Um, and then um, Greens WA MP Brad Pettit will be facilitating. So it'll be, it'll be a good one. Oh, amazing. Cool. Well, yeah, thank you. As I said before, um, I'll make sure that people get that, those event details, but, um, yeah, have a good, you know, um, keep up the fight and I'll make sure that people know about, um, the upcoming events, but yeah, I, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for speaking to me. It's been fun. Yeah. No worries. We'll do it again. Okay. Yes, for sure. See ya.